This is Keys to the Shop, episode 384, how to run a successful coffee cart with Sarah Naylor of Daybreak Coffee Cart. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show, and I am so happy to have you along. Please do subscribe to Keys to the Shop. You'll always be updated with new episodes. Also, share these episodes with your friends. Share it on your social media and with your team so that everybody can get the benefit of these great interviews with practical, relevant, actionable takeaways to help you in your career and your coffee business. It only takes a minute. And if you really love this show and what uh, Keys to the Shop has been doing over the past six years, uh, go ahead and leave a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts. That really does help the show. Now, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you and your coffee business. Whether we're talking on-site assessments of your cafe or one-on-one coaching to help you along the process of setting up your coffee business the right way the first time or helping you take your existing coffee operations to the next level, just email chris at keystotheshop.com to set up a free discovery call where we can talk all about what's going on, what you need, and how I can help. Again, the email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keystotheshop.com. There's a lot of choices out there when it comes to what you're going to brew your coffee with in your coffee bar. And you could go with the standard fare in terms of batch brewers that gives you what we know is a good product. But if you want your product to really stand out amongst a sea of people using the same equipment and truly have a competitive edge in terms of the taste of your coffee and have your coffee just shown in its best possible light, then you need to take a look at the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. Their SCA award-winning technology allows you to extract an incredible range of flavors with the utmost precision The extraction capabilities of this machine are truly impressive. It not only levels up batch brew coffee, but it also makes tea, batched iced lattes, batched cold brew. So on top of that increased quality, you get more efficiency, you get more profitability. And this is all in a small footprint. It's easy to use and train your staff on. Check them out at groundcontrol.coffee for more information. It really is something that you need to think about putting in your cafe if you're interested in taking your coffee to that next level. Again, check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. A lot of the episodes on this show have talked about the home user revolution or the consuming re- the consumer revolution. The standard that we have gotten people used to is higher than ever. And that's not just for coffee. That's for coffee drinks in general. And that extends out to plant-based beverages. And if you want to stay competitive, if you want to offer the best, then you should be using the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series is a line of plant-based performance beverages that is designed for baristas and approved by baristas all over the world. And you'll know that it performs on the bar because it stands up to the heat from steaming, provides amazing texture for latte art, and creates balance in the cup so that you get this coffee-forward drink that's just hard harmonious and beautiful. They really do a great job. Check them out at pacificfoodservice.com and get samples in your store. Try it for yourself. If you're looking for the best out there for serving your customers, amazing plant-based beverages. I think it needs to be the Barista Series from Pacific. Okay, everybody. Well, today's episode is going to be a great one. Um, This is a subject, uh, coffee carts in particular, that is so Um, appropriate to talk about right now, especially after we've gone through the last couple of years through the pandemic and seen the uptick in uh, convenience coffee and mobile coffee even more so. Uh, The idea of getting into the coffee business for a lot of people was something that they had had in the back of their mind. But you know, the pandemic made them think, you know, we just got to go for it. You know, at least from my perspective and what I've seen in the industry, there's a lot of people entering in, but they don't necessarily want to start with a brick and mortar. In fact, maybe they don't even want to do a brick and mortar. They just want to do a coffee and make coffee and do so in a way that's flexible um, and, and is not as big of a step into the world of retail as a, a brick and mortar might be. And mobile coffee and uh, coffee cart is a perfect opportunity for many to do 
just that. And so today I've invited on the show the owner and founder of Daybreak Coffee Cart, Sarah Naylor. Daybreak is a mobile coffee cart and craft coffee catering service located in Snohomish County, Washington. Sarah has worked in the coffee industry for over 11 years and has worked in the world of pastry arts for eight years. Being able to work as a barista, learn coffee science, as well as the craft has allowed Sarah to learn about different aspects of growers, communities, roasters, and of course, the people that serve coffee. What Sarah really loves is serving others with hospitality and creating something that is custom for each person. And Daybreak Coffee Cart was the perfect vehicle for this, wanting to cultivate an experience of comfort and connection for all of the guests that she serves at various events. The cart makes it lots of different places. And so there's, again, uh, you know, the cart has this ability to be present in a lot of different contexts and it's a unique hospitality experience. And Sarah, has such a great business mind as well as a hospitality mind around coffee and serving in this capacity through a mobile operation. Sarah put on a free webinar recently with a collection of coffee professionals, including herself, breaking down the business and the operations and the management and all that stuff. And it was a really generous display of information to benefit the coffee community. And I think today's episode is no different. So get ready to be inspired and to learn a lot today as we talk about running a great coffee cart with Sarah Naylor. All right, Sarah, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Glad to have you on the show. How's it going today? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Um, I'm excited to have you on because, you know, I was a fly on the wall to your uh, free webinar that you put on where you collected some pretty uh, great minds in the coffee space, including your own, uh, to present information <laughs> on running a great coffee cart and coffee business. And I thought it was really fun and, and it was very informative. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a topic that people are thinking about, especially post-pandemic uh, or at least after the last couple of years, because um, it feels like a good, maybe a, a not as risky way of getting into coffee. So I, personally, you know, as a consultant, I, I see a lot of people trying to go this route first versus brick and mortar. And um, But there's still a lot to learn and still a lot to know. And you're so generous with your information. And I, I loved your heart for, for people in hospitality. So uh, here we are. Uh, thank you for coming on. Of course. Thank you. It's been just an incredible journey being able to share with people uh, my own story and how I kind of got into this world of just being able to serve others. And I really like the coffee industry for that. I think it's really focused on hospitality and that's definitely my wheelhouse. And I think you're right, you know, being post pandemic, a lot of people had a lot of time to kind of reflect on what their heart desires were and really kind of follow the paths in life that were most important to them. And I think it's such a great way for people to see without the, you know, the pressure of having to go lease a building or anything right away to start small and see if it's something that one, they enjoy first and foremost, and then two, be able to scale it up in a responsible way. It's been pretty cool to see so many people take a risk on their dreams and have it succeed. Yeah, well put, well put. And also a perfect segue to the idea of how did you start in coffee? Um, what was your initial introduction <laughs> to, because I know you've done a lot of work as a barista. You've been in this for like 11 years now, right? Right. Yeah, it's been, it's definitely, my story's kind of uh, an interesting one. So I'm actually a pastry chef by trade. That is uh, what I went to school for. And I was introduced to coffee as a, uh, when I was going to uh, Washington State University through their hospitality program. And I was first introduced to that idea of, you know, having a barista kind of for the sake of, you know, a bed and breakfast type situation. And so I worked part-time as a barista through the university as a work-study program. And I learned how some barista skills, you know, it's going to be kind of different depending where you are. This was much more just kind of a, a low-risk situation where there wasn't a ton of training, but it was fun to be introduced to coffee. And I think college students are a little bit more forgiving in when you're learning <laughs> because they just need the caffeine to get through dead week. And so that was sort of how I started. And then I went into 
culinary school to become a pastry chef. And that's where I have my background. And especially within hospitality and knowing your uh, what it takes to go from just not just like, you know, baking bread or eclairs or anything like that, but my degree is in uh, bakery business management. So basically starting up from scratch a bakery. And I worked part-time as a barista on the side while I was developing those skills and also working as a pastry chef for a few restaurants down in Portland, Oregon. And it's just been an interesting journey. You know, I kind of walked away from it for a little bit just because I was focusing much more in the pastry arts world and doing sugar competitions and chocolate competitions and then helping a few other restaurants kind of launch their pastry programs uh, to where maybe they had started out as a coffee shop and were wanting to do value-added products onto their business. And so kind of teaching them recipes, how to scale, what equipment they needed, and that sort of thing. Uh, Then my husband and I met, (laughs) and we ended up getting married, and we moved up to Washington uh, State. We're both from Washington originally, and uh, I worked in a few bakeries out here. I started my own business as a wedding cake uh, specialist, so I would create dessert bars, wedding cakes for some of the high-end clients down in the Seattle and Bellevue area. And then I ended up taking some time off when I had my, my first son. He's three now. And I took some time off because I ended up having a really hard delivery. I ended up um, having a blood clot in my lungs and having to be in the ICU for about three weeks. And we ended up moving in with his in-laws for four months because I needed so much medical care uh, postpartum. And uh, that really kind of, there was a there was a lot of mental stuff going on within that season as well. And it just got me to this place that, it, accepting help has always been sort of hard for me. It's very difficult to feel like I can't do it myself, especially when it came to being a new mom and sort of that mom guilt that kind of comes in. And then I was just put in this situation where I, I so completely relied on my in-laws and my husband, and I'm so thankful for all of their help um, because it was something where, you know, I couldn't hold my son. I couldn't feed him. I had to definitely take the hands that were extended to me. And it, it was just such a season of growth for me and kind of dealing with some things to get me to a point where, okay, it is okay to accept help without sort of having a victim mentality in it as well. And then going from that place of needing so much help to gaining some strength back and mentally kind of traversing the new road ahead of me. And then we had my daughter prob- a year and a half after we had my son, Josh, which was just sort of crazy because I didn't really know if I wanted to have any more kids after that experience. But it was definitely just sort of a story of redemption for me. And watching her grow up has just been so sweet. She's one and a half now. And just going through that season really made me focus on, you know, I want to be that hand to other people. I want to be that person who helps others because I know what it feels like to be in a situation where you have no control and you don't necessarily know the path in front of you. And I was very blessed to have people in my life who could help me along that way. So it just kind of broke me in a good way. And so that's sort of what changed my path. I decided I wasn't going to be doing wedding cakes anymore. I wasn't going to be doing uh, event services like that. I definitely just kind of, I took that season to really be with my family and grow as a new mom and really figure out what true service meant to me. And so (laughs) long story, it ended up uh, launching my coffee cart business. So I decided, you know, post pandemic, I really missed talking to people. I really missed connecting with others. And I knew how much impact that could have on someone's life, just that little interaction within one day. So my husband and I talked about what if we just try this? Um, what if I just try setting up a coffee cart at a wedding? Because for me, that's the world that I knew. I was coming from the wedding industry, doing wedding cakes and desserts. I knew that there were people within a wedding setting that, you know, weddings can be very emotional. (laughs) And I love being able to interact with those people and just have a good time during that day. And coffee is something that I think so many people can connect over. So that's sort of how I got started in it. And, you know, I started in July. I wasn't actually supposed to launch until 2024, 
but it's just taken off and it's just had a world of its own. And it's been so cool to see how this community has sort of formed around it. Wow. It, that's an epic journey right there. Uh, <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there there's so much to, to kind of think about here, uh, especially the idea that you had, you had been under pressure uh, through your pursuits in pastry. You've participated in competitions. You were working side by side with other professionals in an industry where I'm sure there's a lot of competition. Um, and with pastry and baking and things, it's a very precision uh, culinary practice, right? Um, oh, and definitely. so that in and of itself is a, is kind of a pressure. But then there's this other world, the personal world that uh, is also coming alongside of all of this professional development and pursuits. And it, it recalibrated the way that you thought about the way you were spending your time and you know what you were doing with your energy. How do you dip back into that world of your experience in pastry and uh, professional pursuits and apply it to your goals now that you have sort of entered into a different kind of era of, of uh, business and service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's definitely been a, an interesting sort of crossover. I can, it is very precision based, like you said, but it is also very competition based. And for me, I think after experiencing what I did, I, it allowed me to sort of disengage from that social competition and that pressure that I felt on myself to be at a certain level and of success within that versus now it's made me have so much more patience for myself and grace for myself and where my business is at and what it's doing, which has allowed it to sort of grow organically on its own because there hasn't been really any pressure on it. Um, for me, just putting my family first above all has definitely been, I think, the biggest change because before children and uh, before marriage, you know, I think it's just something where it's your life and you're kind of operating around that and what you want to do with it. And after you get married, you know, there's definitely an acclimation and then you add children into that. And for me, uh, I, I didn't grow up in a home with, uh, you know, the typical married parents. I was, uh, I was alone a lot and it really made me appreciate becoming a mom, wanting to spend that time with them and going from a place to where within the culinary world, as you know, some days I was doing 16 hour shifts, I get one 20 hour break. I would work for a week straight. It was definitely draining physically and mentally. <laughs> and it's something mm. that can very quickly, if you are not aware of it, just take over your life to a point where it's just second nature, uh, second nature that you expect that that is what you are supposed to do within that job that you have. And having the ability to kind of step back now and look at it and realize, man, I was just killing myself for something that I maybe halfway enjoyed versus now where because my focus isn't the isn't the pressure of keeping up with others I am so much happier and it's just been really awesome to see people within the coffee community I think that every community can have that pressure in it uh, depending on personalities and the pursuits that you're going within it um, I know that the coffee industry does have a competitive uh, side to it. But honestly, for me, there's just been so many people who have come alongside and just encouraged me. And that's something that I hadn't experienced within the pastry world before. So that has been just, it's just made things so much easier to kind of jump start. And it's been really fun to just watch other people's journeys and have people cheering you on. I think that it's so easy to say community over competition, but not really mean it. Um, Within this community, it's definitely been meant, you know, I've, within that webinar, there were so many people within there that I have looked up, including yourself, that I've looked up to for, you know, years in how you guys have run businesses and have been within your own industry. And to have you guys kind of just join the webinar and give your your two cents and your advice, that was just incredible. And if that's all that comes from my business, I'm happy, you know. Uh, this is something that I think that God has just kind of blessed me with, a different 
walk in life. And if I can help others figure out what that walk is for them, I want to come alongside them and encourage them. It's great. And you know, coffee is also very much that uh, platform on which a lot of that kind of discovery and uh, you know, relationship building happens for customers, the people that you're serving at these events, they're, they're, they're events that people are going to remember forever. And, uh, there's relationships that form in these times. And when people go to coffee bars, the same thing happens. Life happens over a cup of coffee, not to sound too pithy or I could put that, <laughs> I could sell that on Etsy if I printed I it a on a plank of wood or something. <laughs> But it's definitely, uh, I don't know if it's unique to coffee, but we seek that out as people. And the model of doing a cart is especially interesting because you get to, you know, go to a lot of different places where the the focus, you know, everyone's social expectations are, are heightened. And uh, you bring in a bit of this deeper element, especially through the way you do business, because you could get a different coffee cart to go to a, a place that maybe is a little bit more transactional, a little bit more, you know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not steeped in the kind of um, depth that, I mean, I just heard you talk about here. And so that there, there, there's this professional urgency, but then there's this depth of the why behind the what, mm -hmm. right? Um, so talk a little bit about as you stepped into doing the cart, and doing mobile coffee as a pursuit, arrange your values. How did you dis de determine how you're going to run things, practically speaking? Sure, yeah, so for me, I mean, I'm gonna go back again to my family. Within the event industry, it, that's just sort of what I knew and what I enjoyed. I love being a part of the uniting of families. And I just, I needed, to have a sense of of a routine established for my kids. And this weddings are something where it is a set date for a set amount of time. It's a high ticket income level. So I'm able to sort of work around my husband's work schedule, work around my children so that I'm still there with them. And I can still do, you know, I can do one event a month or I can do eight in a month if I want. I can kind of choose how I want to scale within it. And something that's pretty cool about the coffee cart industry is that you can choose what road you want to go down, whether that's you're going to start small and you're going to do a farmer's market, you're going to create a customer base, or you're going to do large scale events like mine, or you're going to be, you know, popping up in different corporate buildings. It's just, you can hit it hard and fast if you want to. You can do eight to 10 events in a week uh, that are smaller ticket, you know, maybe you're making a couple hundred bucks for each one. Because of my family values and wanting to be here full time, I wanted to make sure I was booking events that were going to be paying over $1,000 a month and that I was only doing three to four of those events within a month because I valued my time a little bit differently than I did when I was in college. That's something that's pretty cool about it is that if you're still in college or you're working a full time job, you can start small, you can you can keep it as a side hustle and scale it to where you are within your life without the pressure of you having, say, a full coffee truck where you're having to pay off a loan that you took out for it or you're paying for insurance or permitting for that. You know, you can kind of scale a coffee cart to really whatever is going to work for you and your life situation. Um, it's I, right now, at this point in my life, I have no interest in running a cafe or a bakery, you know, I, I don't want to be gone from my home for that long uh, because it's just such an investment of time. And for me, that's just where my life is right now. And some people, that's their dream. That's their goal. You know, I've, the webinar opened up a, a few different doors for people who reached out and said, I would love to work with you and, uh, you know, start a coffee cart and scale up into a cafe. And that's great. That's awesome that they have that as a goal. For me, that's just, that's not where I am. My goal is to just kind of help people facilitate their own dreams. While I, and that allows me to still be home with my kids and my family. You know, it takes some people a really long time and a lot of heartache to come to that conclusion. Uh, and so they've built up a business that they can't get away from. And in fact, a lot of coffee businesses uh, over the course of the pandemic that were in that situation where it got out of control and they didn't know how to stop, that was the stop. 
And so a lot of businesses were forcibly closed, you know, that didn't want to close. And some people were just like, oh, thank God, you know, like, <laughs> just a sigh of relief. And, and, <laughs> yeah, not, not to make it a glib situ situation. It's difficult. Right. But at the same time for, I, I could list out several uh, places where this is the case. And so coming at this from that place of um, having that, having that foundational understanding to begin with is really great. So let's, get into the idea of what you did to set up your cart in the first place. So you say, well, gee, I'm going to set up a cart. So <laughs> how does that, <laughs> how does that happen? Why, practically speaking, because I'm thinking people are, are listening going, okay, how do first I do steps. That? <laughs> I mean, where are the things that I, I need to do to make that happen? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had a few Pinterest boards worth of ideas at this point of different uh, different right. ways you can kind of set up a cart and you know it, that's what's crazy about it too is it's kind of eyes of the beholder type of a situation in, in what you create and what's going to work for you and so for me I I reached out to a couple of different suppliers that pre-made carts and some of them were great but they really weren't worth the expense that was coming with the time of the shipping you know, I, for me, I didn't want to have to pay an exorbitant amount of money to then get a cart six months later. Um, it was something that if I was going to invest in and have a full structural cart, that I would need to see a return on that within three months because I just really, I didn't want this to become something that was going to be draining our personal finances. So being able to kind of look at, okay, this is, X, this is the X amount of money that I want to make within this next year. This is the amount of the investment that I'm going to have to put into it. And then these are the types of events I'm going to be doing. This is how many events I need to do within this time frame to then pay back that investment before I receive a return on investment. And that's just kind of my mentality from being trained in bakery management. I know some people may not really know where to start in that but for me it was very important that it didn't affect my personal finances so i went about it in the way of i started an llc which is a limited liability company this separates you and your company so if you kind of think about it in the sense that whatever you are buying and operating throughout your llc whether that's your espresso machine or uh, for me, you know, I had to buy a sink and a generator and a water filter. All of that is owned by my LLC company so that if anything were to happen, say, you know, I get hit on the freeway or my trailer gets backed up into or something, that is uh, my company is the one that covers that versus my personal finances of it being deducted from my personal insurance. So I really heavily stress just kind of if you are going to go into this full-time or even part-time and you're wanting to transition to full-time, to make sure that you have your foundations built so that you can do that. It is a lot harder for you to kind of start out and then go backwards. Um, so I started, I, I made sure that I had a business license. I researched a bunch of different health permits. Uh, Seattle is kind of going through this, uh, the revamping of their food truck permitting process and what is required. And that it's a lot of money <laughs> and it wasn't something that I fully wanted to spend on right now to then wait another 16 weeks before my plan even got looked at, let alone approved. Uh, within the private event industry, there is a smaller plan that you can follow to make sure that your, your cart is up to code, but because you are booking private events, you are strictly held to a health permit in the sense of like a private caterer. So you're not going to be permitted as a full food truck that does limit me only to private events. I can't pop up at a farmer's market without having a different sort of permit. So when I looked at the cart doing all of these more permanent large scale events, I wanted it to be something that could hold up to the wear and tear of travel. Um, I'm a pretty small person, you know, I'm five foot even on a good hair day. And so <laughs> I didn't really want a collapsible cart just because I know the wear and tear that would come from my body. Uh, within the the pastry chef world and all of that, I was lifting. I tore a rota rotator cuff. I tore my both of my meniscus. <laughs> so I know like the strenuous that's like activities that come with it. And so for me, it wasn't worth doing a breakdown cart because I didn't want to have to constantly be pulling, 
you know, a hundred pound espresso machine out of my trunk every time or pulling out full water tanks every time. So it was important for me to have a permanent structure. And because I had chosen the client base of basically a higher ticket revenue, I wanted to be able to serve, I wanted my average customer service within two hours be at least 200 guests. That kind of limits me to the structure that I'm going to have built and I wanted it to last longer. So I chose to have a a metal cart built by a local welder. I gave him the plans and we kind of adjusted as we went. So it, it wasn't what I originally designed, but it was adapted to kind of suit the needs that I would have. Um, It's an all white aluminum cart and being within the wedding industry, I wanted it to be able to blend in with whatever sort of theme that they had. And it has an all butcher block top. So I was meeting the NSF food safety standards as well. I didn't want to have to bring in a bunch of ice chests to have all of my milk and ice stored. So I had an under counter refrigerator installed. I also have a hand sink installed because with a lot of these private events, I didn't want to have to deal with having an extra permit. And within my county, at least, after the event is over, I can transition it into a three-compartment sink for sanitizing with uh, a few extra bus tubs. And this is all stuff that I had experience in with doing the pastry arts world. So I kind of knew the setup I would need to not necessarily find the loophole within the permit, but if a health inspector were to show up at a wedding, I would still pass with flying colors. And I think it's just important that you kind of set yourself, you set yourself up for success in that way, because I didn't want to have to pay a fine for something I didn't know later on. So it's, it's a really heavy cart. I do have to have a trailer to haul it around because of all of the weight I added on with the refrigerator Uh, But it's permanent, and it's basically, it's one step down from a full food truck. So I'm able to serve, I think the biggest event that I've done so far was almost 600 people. And it didn't have a problem at all. If I were to do a knockdown cart with um, a single espresso machine, I, I don't know that I could do that many people, realistically, without having to refill water tanks and bring in extra equipment. So that's kind of the way that I set myself up within this structure to be successful. I mean, all the stuff you're talking about right now, obviously the the pastry experience. And also I imagine, you know, working as a barista, you've got an intuitive sense for flow and, and, and workflow to be able to make these decisions about, well, the cart needs to be this large for this number of guests. And this is the flow of where they're going to take the order and how we're going to finish the drink and where they, they pick things up. Um, is, is that the case? Does a lot of your barista experience help you kind of set up the right kind of design for this cart? Oh, absolutely. I think if you have different, I've worked at different barista jobs throughout the years, and you can tell the difference between a well set up bar and a poorly set up bar. Uh, when you're having to go back and forth between your front bar and your back bar five times to make one drink, it's going to extend the time mm-hmm. it takes you to make one drink. I didn't want to spend eight minutes making one latte for a guest. Like that's just unnecessary. (laughs) And you get a lot of people that are just kind of uh, impatient at that point, but it also frazzles you, you know, then you're kind of making, you start making mistakes because you're taking so long. And that was just something that I wanted to avoid. And I think that having a good idea of a workflow uh, can really save you time. Uh, Maxwell Mooney speaks a lot to this of having effective systems and knowing what steps that are unnecessary that you can cut out to optimize your workflow. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a game that never stops. Honestly, like you could set it up right in the beginning and say, well, this is definitely a great system, but you're going to be, um, you know, refining that thing, uh, hopefully, you know, over and over again throughout the entirety of your, your business, uh, because your business is going to change and, you know, if you go from 600 to one day 700, I mean, you might be discovering different <laughs> <laughs> levels at which you need to refine something that oh, absolutely. you couldn't just rely on your old way of doing things. Yeah, this happened to me yesterday, actually. <laughs> I was at oh, an really? Ev- I, oh, yeah, I was at an event and um, I wasn't able to have a second set of hands. And the usually the cart takes two people to, to load and offload because of how heavy it is. Um, and it was just going to be me doing it and it's the cart by with all of the the equipment and the water and the storage on it it's probably around 400 pounds 
And getting that on and off of a trailer by myself, that's impossible. Mm. Not without like getting run over and flattened like a pancake. That's just not going to work. So kind of cutting some corners and getting a self-mounted winch for my trailer to then hook it up to the cart where it pulls it up and uh, releases it down so that if I'm doing a single event, it's saving me that extra labor and time, but it's also saving my body. Right. Well, it's also helping anybody who helps you in the future who similarly might not be able to exert the same kind of force. And I know that this is true with um, roasteries. I think the first example of this was that I saw was uh, uh, Trish over at uh, Wrecking Ball. They put in a pulley system for people who uh, needed uh, for people who needed it to be able to lift bags of coffee that couldn't just like hike up giant bags of coffee oh, that's to so make smart. it more accessible for, I for totally somebody I wish to work I in had a... that in a bakery because, yeah. you know, being five foot and lifting 50 pound bags of flour over and over and over again, <laughs> it's just like, oh, this is half my body weight. What am I going to do? Like, oh, that's so smart. I wish we had that. All right. So at this time, you know, you've got the cart permits and you've, you've got the design of the cart and everything else, but you also have the... Uh, decision on to what you're going to serve and it, you probably already did this before you designed the cart but let's talk about that a bit because people whether they already have a coffee business or they're just getting started this is a major hanging up point for a lot of people because they tend to overdo it over promise and under deliver which i imagine would be like the kiss of death at an event oh yeah and it's hard because you know you want to serve people well And so you want to give them a plethora of options, but honestly, it it can become overwhelming. Uh, For me, it was really important to kind of streamline this process just because I knew working alone the amount of time I was going to have. Uh, Within my own county, uh, coffee carts aren't allowed to have a blender. So that doesn't, because there's no correct way to sanitize it in between customers. So I automatically knew I didn't want to do any blended drinks. I am definitely a coffee person, so I don't want to dive into the energy drink world. I think Lotus and Red Bull are awesome, but that's just not for me and or my personal choice. Plus, it, it's going to clutter up your, your tabletop because you're going to have all these different syrup additions. And for me, it was definitely about saving counter space because my machine is a little bit larger. So I chose to really only offer uh, six syrups per event. They Guests can kind of choose to add on one or two different ones, but I didn't want to have so many different flavor options that on the back end, you know, I was wasting syrup. Because if I'm only doing like two or events a month, at least within like my own business right now, I don't want to have 20 open syrup bottles that I then have to throw away, you know, because that's just going to be a loss of inventory for me. And I don't really want to have that extra expenditure by limiting the flavors to six and maybe doing a rotational seasonal flavor, I'm kind of eliminating that risk and needing to have back stock. And it also, I think with the clients, gives them a clearer picture of what they're paying for. I also have kind of streamlined my service to where if I say I'm doing an event and there's going to be 200 people there, I offer, and this is going to be different for everyone depending on the product that they want to use and how much they're going to sell. For me, I do 8-ounce hot drinks and 12-ounce cold. Some people are going to be like, what? That's that's not anything. Like, why why are you not giving them 16 ounce or 20 ounce? Well, there's a couple of <laughs> reasons behind that. Uh, when you're at a wedding, you know, there might be a cocktail hour and an appetizer hour and the dinner and the cake. By the end of the night, no one's going to be finishing a 16 ounce latte. I don't really want to have to, like, spend the extra money that it's going to take in that bus. It also kind of compromises your bar system. If you're going between single shots and double shots, you're constantly having to exchange your porta filters out. And I wanted mine to be streamlined. So eight ounce drinks and 12 ounce drinks get uh, the single shot with on my cart and they're still getting the same volume, but they're also getting unlimited drinks throughout the entire service. So the people that really Mm. want coffee are going to be coming back for multiple drinks Versus the people that just sort of wanted to try it and then they have four or five bar tickets so they go and they get their martini or something. So this kind of eliminated an extra step for me to where I was having to switch between porta filters, having to switch between also my measurements on syrups for different sort of drinks. Everything is kind of, it was measured out to be the same. It's this many pumps, 
it's this many shots, it's this much ice, it's this much water that's going into the machine, it's this much milk that I'm pouring into the glass. So it sort of allowed me to kind of streamline and really keep my costs down to where I could really narrow in and know my profit margins. That's all very precise. It sounds like you've uh, done some costing before in your <laughs> line of <laughs> Oh, work. yeah. So that's totally my background. Um, it's being a part of the bakery management program. I learned that, you know, it's not the big expenditures that normally make your business fail. It's the pennies of each day that do. It's you not going mm-hmm. in and scraping the bowl every time you're making cake batter because you're losing four or five different cakes within not scraping your bowls or accurately measuring things. And so that was kind of my approach to it. I went through and I made a, a spreadsheet. I costed out all of my ingredients by the size. I converted it into grams just because that's what the pastry world does. That's right. And yeah. it gives you an accurate, everything weighs different and everything measures different when it comes to volume. So by converting everything to weight and then multiplying that by how much I was using of each ingredient for one drink, I was able to figure out, okay, this is how much one latte cost me, including the cup, the syrup, the milk, and then adding in my service time. Then I was able to figure out, okay, this is what I can realistically spend and this is how much I need to charge to then return a profit. What part of that pricing is you making a reasonable prediction of number of people that you serve? Sure. Yeah. So this is going to kind of change for for everyone. Um, Seattle, I I know inflation has hit people hard. Seattle is, I think, one where cost of goods have really gone up, which has really affected uh, how I serve. Within the wedding industry, you are much more an event-based service than you are a coffee service. So you kind of have to approach pricing from it as like you're getting paid to provide a an event service. You know, you're not going and parking on the side of the street and just mm-hmm. setting coffee up so you can sell it for super cheap. Like you are literally bringing a cafe to them. So you need to be able to cost out your your travel, the wear and tear on your trailer, the cost of your insurance, and then kind of figure out realistically what you need to charge to have that return. Because it's not something where you're clocking in for the for the service. You have all the back end stuff where you're loading up the trailer, you're loading up your car, you're traveling there, then you're serving, and then you're breaking down, and then you're coming home and you're washing all those dishes. So you kind of, or you know, going to your commissary kitchen and doing that and then going home. So you have to kind of incorporate all of those different factors into your cost. Um, I think I have it a little easier when it comes to that because, you know, my aunt and uncle, they've had a, a <clears throat> excuse me, my aunt and uncle have a business where they only do event shows. And so I kind of grew up in the atmosphere of like knowing this is how long it takes me to set up my pop-up tent, to unload the trailer, to put my product out. So I kind of knew the time investment part of that. You're valuing your time, which is something that maybe someone who's really desperate for acceptance of their new business might be reticent to do because they're like, it's okay. It's, it's my business. I'll, I'll, you know, they, it's just the same reason why people really don't pay themselves. Um, and when they could, but they just, they don't, and, uh, they don't consider their time part of the investment. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I've been there, you know, (laughs) it's uh, going back to, you know, when I was working 16 hour shifts and not sleeping. And then, you know, I was walking away because I was getting paid as an independent contractor and not on their revenue after travel. I was getting paid like three dollars an hour. It just was not Mm. worth it just for that experience, you know. Um, So I've, I've been on that that side where you just are trying so hard to get something to launch that you're willing to take a pay cut because you think that you're going to in the end get clients. But honestly, it's just such a disservice to you and your business because then people expect that from you from day one. They hear that your friend got this discount and why are you charging them twice as much? And then the more you give out deals, the less you're going to make and the more miserable you're going to be. Honestly, you're not going to want to do it after a while. And then you feel like you can't accurately charge going forward. And it's going to be so much harder for you as a business owner to maybe be two years in and then have to adjust your pricing if you never counted your time as part of your overall costs. Because then your business is set up to run without you running it, but you're having to be there 24 hours. And oh yeah, exactly. The, it, what you're saying is perfect because it's also when you have other people working for you now and you need to raise the prices up, 
but you can't because you've been typecast as that person because you've been the barista or the server. Uh, you can't do it forever. So you're either going to do it forever and limit the growth of your business, or you're just going to be kind of up a creek a little bit when it comes to scaling because it's going to come at, come after you at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not just for people that are solely operating coffee carts either. I, you know, if you're a retailer currently looking to add a mobile presence to your uh, to your brand, you know, that's something that still it matters. Oh, you know, absolutely. In terms of valuing time and effort as a, as a part of it, because you probably could throw more money at it than an independent operator. That still wouldn't be wise. No, yeah, because it's so different. Like because you're your baristas that you might have on the bar at your shop are going to be have different expectations than the baristas you send to events. Because the baristas that you're sending to events, they're responsible for your car, for your trailer, for setting up, for transporting. You know, you they're, they're having to be kind of the star of the show while they're there, and you have to trust them within that responsibility. So you kind of got to compensate for that, but then also allow an extra like revenue cap to cover any sort of mistakes when it comes to if someone rear ends the trailer while they're out. You know, it's something that you can really not foresee and spend a lot of money on that's unnecessary or not spend enough money and then be like you said kind of up the creek when something bad happens and it's really okay so i'm trying to you know be devil's advocate here in a a way or at least get into the idea of what somebody might push back against which is you know these contingency costs aren't necessarily you know should they be passed on to the consumer like mm-hmm. they just want somebody to set up at their wedding or they just want a latte. You know, like, why am I going to charge them in my pricing for the things that may happen, but, you know, end up not happening? Uh, so convince me <laughs> about, about oh, this man. because it feels like I want, I'm, I'm so generous, you know, I don't want to be generous. And that's my thing too. I have such a hard time saying no to people. But within this, I've really had to set up those boundaries because it takes One time, it doesn't matter if you don't think it's going to happen, something's going to happen. And when it does happen, you're going to be like, man, I really should have insured my espresso machine, you know, like, because when you're traveling, if it falls off your trailer, that's an $8,000, maybe $10,000 espresso machine that you are now out the money personally because you didn't have insurance on it and your business isn't making enough money to cover it. You know, it only takes one thing happen that is outside of your control. And there are so many things in your life that are outside of your control to then kind of effectively shut you down. So if you're not prepared to have those things built in, then you're kind of setting yourself up for failure at some point. You know, it's it's not that it it's never going to happen because it will. It's just when is it going to happen, you know? And so just kind of, I'm just a firm believer in setting yourself up because say you go to an event and you don't have, you set up at a farmer's market and you don't have a permit. You've been making good money, but you just never went and you got a permit. It takes the one shutdown for the one health inspector that came to just effectively close you down for good. And then if you ever try to set up again, people are going to remember, oh man, they were operating without a food permit. They, you know, it just, you don't know what people are going to do with that information. And it's just kind of like, that's not something I am willing to risk. You know, I'm not willing to put my family at risk in a situation like that. So being able to kind of, one, set up the LLC again, I think is a very important thing because then you're not tying in your personal finances to say if someone says a drink is too hot and they burn their tongue and they want to sue you, well, then they have to go through the LLC. They can't take my house, basically. You know, not that they really could take my house, but it's just, you know, it's it's setting yourself up for the people that kind of are going to push back a little, maybe because I just think there's so many people out there that kind of want money. Uh, but you know, <laughs> like the people yeah, who go to yeah. Wendy's and find whatever in the chili and they start suing them for no reason. It's just, <laughs> I want to protect my people like myself and my family from those sorts of people. And I think mm-hmm. it's just so much easier for you to be set up from the get go. It might mean that you turn down events and that's really hard because then it might feel like you're not making any progress within your business. You know, I've, it's holiday season right now and I've been like, really fighting the urge to do as many events as I can because I know it's such a big season. But, you know, saying no, I think I've said no to probably, I think, 75 events this month. And I've done maybe three or four. And that's a lot. Like, when you hear that number, it's a lot. And you're like, oh, my gosh, you're going to ruin your business. You're not taking on any new clients. How are you going to stay afloat? 
And I feel that. I feel that in my soul. It's so hard to say no. But at the same time, I know if I want this business to succeed, I cannot overextend myself. There's no way I could do 75 events by myself and find childcare and work around my husband's schedule and still enjoy the Christmas season with my family. Yeah, not every opportunity is the right one. Exactly. And, and you don't want people to shortchange you. You know, you don't, you don't want to work with I'm, <laughs> Everyone is going to ask you for a discount. I honestly, the people that I have worked with in the past within my baking business that, you know, said, well, my friend got it for this much. Those were the people that were really unpleasant to work with. You know, they yeah. were like nitpicking everything. They were wanting to like get a discount for every little thing. And then they... It was just not worth it to me. Those are the people you don't want to work with anyway. If I, I want to work with people who are truly going to enjoy the service and the time because I think that's just best suited for both of us. That's a unique aspect of doing, an, especially an events-based um, business like yours, is that you have the veto power. You know, if you operate a uh, business like a, a brick and mortar, I mean, yeah, you have the right to refuse service, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. But... It, there's there's all stripes of people coming in and it's 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 a public institution whereas you know having a cart is as open as you want you know your business to be obviously and hospitable you don't have to say yes to joining yourself to somebody who you find out is doing some shady stuff or mm -hmm. you know gives you bad vibes in the process of of negotiation and things you can shut it down yeah, I think it's important that you work with people who want to work with you because if they are just really trying to get a deal, it's it's going to really negative. It's going to be negative for their event as well. And you're going to walk away feeling super discouraged. You're going to walk away feeling like, man, should I really even be in this business? That was miserable. I don't want to do this if every event's going to be like that. You know, you got to be willing to kind of stand up for yourself and protect yourself and allow yourself to find the clients that you enjoy being around. Okay. How do you find those clients? Let's say you have all of this stuff in line. Mm -hmm. You're good to go, right? Except there's other people maybe doing it too. They're competing for mm -hmm. this business and you want that business. Uh, do you just set up a website and then sit in front of the computer and wait? I mean, what, what, what happens to get <laughs> uh, this business? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, so uh, going on the computer part, I think that having your own website is probably one of the best ways that you can increase your revenue because it is going to be the one little square inch of the internet that you own. It's not going to be chained to Instagram or Facebook changing their algorithm. Uh, it's going to be strictly whatever you put on and Google likes working with small businesses. So the more that you're on there and you're working with your business profile and using SEO, which is search engine optimization, you can basically create a profile that is being displayed to the type of people you want your services to be shown to. So within the Google ad campaigns, which I highly recommend you guys doing this, uh, is they have free classes for using their advertisements. Um, and it's something that you can kind of, you set up a schedule of who you want it to be shown to. So for instance, mine is set up to show to women because that's predominantly the people who end up booking from years 18 to 60 because it's going to be either the bride or the bride's family that's going to usually want to book the cart. Within my, uh, there's like four or five different counties that I have it limited to because that is the service range that I'm willing to travel to. So then my site is only being shown to those people it's not going to show up in Ithaca, New York for Coffee Cart. And then I'm kind of limiting the people who are then contacting me directly through my website or over the phone for me to then just kind of turn around and say, no, I'm sorry, I don't actually, you know, I've gotten a few people before I did this that were from Washington, D.C. and not Washington State. So being able to kind of set your website up for that is really good. But I'm also a firm believer in in-person events because, you know, without community, I don't think that you're going to be successful. Uh, with where I am, there is a there's a huge wedding community. It's called uh, out here in Snohomish, Washington. They have a wedding guild that's been running for 20 years. It's basically a guild of all of the wedding vendors within the industry. So bar service, uh, invitation specialists, they have event organizers, all of those kinds of things. When they come together every other month, they throw on what's essentially a fake wedding that highlights different vendors and provides a, a resource of connections for you and your business. So you're able to kind of go and network and you can kind of figure out who you work best with and they're going to remember you in the sense that, hey, I remember you have a coffee cart. I have a client that's available on this day. 
can I give them your information? And I think that's a really good resource. And, you know, within the Wedding Guild, there's another coffee company that's uh, like mine. It's two sisters that run theirs. They're um, Cascara Coffee Company. And they're great. They're amazing. And when I can't do an event, I send it their way because I truly believe in supporting other people's businesses. There's no way that I could book every wedding in Seattle, even if I wanted to. You know, I can't handle that. So if I can help them by giving them a client that I can't serve, then I'm going to do that. Um, in terms of like the wedding industry and finding clients, you can always do wedding shows. Uh, Seattle has two or three of them a year where it's essentially an expo that brides and grooms or mother-in-laws go to where they're looking for vendors within the area to book. And you can set up your booth. You can have uh, pamphlets. Some of them will allow you to have your cart where you're giving out samples. You can really connect with those couples to then book further into the next year for their own wedding. So there's a lot of networking that you're doing to, un, you you know that there's a community of people that already have tapped into uh, this industry and you need to be a part of that. So guilds and um, associations and you say uh, in-person events um, and then I imagine patients also because you're not going to see the fruit from that right away, right? No, yeah. So you kind of got to look at it in the sense of, okay, if I do the wedding show in January, there's one here in Seattle in January, I'm probably not going to see a return on that investment until either the fall of 2023 or the spring of 2024, just because the people that are coming are not going to be clients that are going to book you within two months. It's going to be an investment of time to where they're going to be booking you a year or two now, out from now. But that also gives you a sense of security because then you're creating a client base to when maybe you do have a slow time, you can email them back and say, were you interested in booking? You are, you know, six months away from your wedding. I met you at the yada yada expo. I really liked working with you. I just wanted to remind you of my services. And then you kind of can create a, your own client base through that. Um, something that I did personally when I started was I went to each and every wedding venue within a 30 mile radius of my house because that's what I was comfortable traveling with. I met with the venue owners. I brought them samples of my coffee. I left them my cards so that whoever was coming to tour the venue, they had access to my information as well. I also joined my local chamber of commerce, and that has been really great in within my own community, local community, of getting to know other business owners. They, they really support you in the sense of your business licensing, offering you a place to print materials, networking events with local community owners. Uh, my town has eight or nine different coffee shops slash coffee stands. And so there, it's a really high competition area, but nobody does deliveries. So they are so quick to just send me those uh, leads because they can't themselves deliver. The Chamber of Commerce is also really great because if you are a coffee cart and you don't have a storefront, they'll still do a pop-up event for you where they do a ribbon cutting. So you're getting published in the paper, you're getting free advertisement, you're getting published on their site, and people within the community are getting to know you and who you are, even if you don't have a physical storefront. Love it. Yes. So this is get out there, make yourself known. You know, you're you're being generous, you're participating in the industry that you are now part, a part of, and that will reap rewards down the line if you're just doing that consistently. There's this confidence thing, I think, also that comes hard. It's hard to come by for some people where I hear you talk and you sound very confident in yourself. And <laughs> you've got a lot of experience. Well, oh, I, maybe man. I'm wrong, you know. <laughs> I am such an introvert, like, and okay. I think people are kind of surprised by that when they talk to me. I am such more a relational one-on-one -on -one person, and going out there is so hard. Doing this interview, really hard. But I, you know, I kind of just, I try to approach it as having a conversation with a close friend, and that seems to kind of ease the burden of the pressure I put on myself. I'm a super analytical, pressurized person, and I, I think I just have high expectations for me how things work in the sense of when I'm putting something out there, I want people to like it. And if they don't, I take it personally and I figure out, Oh man, what could I have done different? Was it something I said, you know, it's so hard to be vulnerable and put that out there. But because I've shared part of my own st uh, story and struggles, I think it's actually helped me in that way because I think when you're vulnerable and where you've come from and what you're doing, it's, it sets you up into a mental place of, you know what? It's okay if I don't get that sale. 
It's okay if I didn't connect with that person. It's okay if I gave samples and they never called me. It was just good to go out and kind of build my own self in that and get stronger in the areas that I'm weak in. How do you discern the opportunity to improve versus uh, what you were just describing as sort of this um, this insecurity spiral where you feel like, oh, everything I'm doing is crap and I'm just going to you know, start over from scratch or I'm just going to copy and paste from somebody else's because obviously what I'm doing is not working. Mm-hmm. You know, that, so th- there's doing better and having c- constructive uh, feedback and then there's that. And so how do you discern between the two? Uh, I think that's going to be different for everybody. For me, I kind of know my tells, you know, when I'm getting worked up in something that maybe isn't really a big deal or uh, I know kind of what my own triggers are. I think that for people who have been through some things in their life and they never really learned how to handle altercations accurately or like at least in a healthy way, you kind of carry that burden with you. So anytime someone says, no, this isn't good enough, it's hitting on all the other instances in your life where you have Mm. been told that. And so then you're perpetually in this cycle of maybe where you're putting more pressure on it than actually something that ever happened, you know? And so it's kind of been just having to retrain my brain. You know, there's this, I think I told you about this yesterday. It was a book by uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a neuroscientist. And reading that book actually really helped me understand the way our brain works. Um, She talks about the effects of positive and negative thought patterns and how a negative thought pattern has like 10 times the impact on your brain and it's easier for neurons to travel than a positive thought. And so when you two, she pulls up a scan of a brain and this patient, it, it shows how a negative thought pattern is really worn down to it's the shape of like a dark pit. And that's how it feels when you're stuck in that, in that thought pattern. It feels like you're just stuck in this pit that mm. you can't get out of, you know, and why would anyone want this? It's not worth it. And then she correlates it over to looking at a positive thought pattern where you can see the neuron had a a huge struggle, but it looks like a tree and it's growing and it's giving life and it's giving, it's so hard. You basically have to rewire your brain to start thinking of things and like, okay, this isn't what I expected it to be, but it's not terrible. And then going from that place to like, okay, it wasn't terrible. It was good for me. And then building on that and basically rewiring your brain to think about it in the aspect of, is this serving me or am I doing this to serve this image of myself that I have and these expectations that I've pulled in from all of these aspects of my life that I am not meeting? And so kind of trying to figure out for you, like, where is my line and how do I want to get there? Do I want to stay in this place of mentality where I feel like I'm never good enough and nothing I do is going to be great? And I mean, I think we all have those days. We all have really bad days. Uh, But being willing to also pull you out of that, pulling yourself out of that mentality, is just going to set you yourself up for success later. You know, I've worked for plenty of people who had very unhealthy uh, patterns. You know, I worked for a couple who were married and their, their marriage, they, they treated their restaurant sort of as a war zone and I hated working there. And it's like, they never, like, they never talked to each other. They would segue through their, their employees to kind of try to like pick fights and stuff. And, you know, they ended up closing within six months. And if you are coming from, whether you're coming from a broken family or you've had a divorce or you've had trauma in your life, where you have never actually sorted through it, you can be projecting that image onto your business. And so if you're not willing to kind of look at that and see like, okay, is this real? Is Did this really happen in the way I think it happened? Or is this me tapping into all of my insecurities from across my life that is then amplifying this reaction? Wow. Not, yeah, that's not to go way, way too deep on you. <laughs> no, that's good, though. We bring ourselves to work every day, and, and our identity is wrapped up oftentimes, whether it's healthy or not. We Our identity is wrapped up in our vocation. And especially when you're starting something new, it, it there's this vulnerability that you feel. Um, and so what you just said, I think, is enormously helpful, uh, and it will help when something does happen like you... <laughs> uh, <laughs> You find out that your fridge underneath your cart, you know, God forbid, 
isn't working when you get to the venue. Oh, you man. know That was like me and the winch. I showed up at the event and like I was able to load the trailer by myself. And then it was so cold. It froze overnight. The chain snapped. So I couldn't offload it at the event. Mm -hmm. So like that could have, I think maybe last year probably spiraled me into this whole thing. Like, oh, I'm never going to do this again. This was the worst thing ever. No one's going to take me seriously. But then I just kind of sucked it up and I went inside. I said, look, I'm, I'm here. I want to serve you. Is there any way that you got an extra set of hands to get the card off? And for some people, I think if they're coming at it from a fr professional aspect, they're going to be like, oh, I would never ask people to help me unload. That's my responsibility. And totally. Yeah, it totally is. But in that one instance, I needed help, so I needed to ask for it. Otherwise, I would have had to cancel the event, you know, and that's going to leave a much worse mark on my business than asking for help from that one person. Yeah. And if you ask for help in a weird way, that definitely, you know, don't do that. Be just oh like, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, don't I, I don't help, be the guy know? that's like showing up and be like, all right, I'm here. I need you to get this out of my car and, you know, you can park over here and yeah. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Like, don't be that person, obviously. But like right. for me, I, I really kind of like what you said earlier and um, setting yourself up so that you're not under delivering and overselling. I, I basically kind of look at it in the thing of how much can I pack into this that is going to make their day. So then when I, the occasion happens that I do need a little bit of help, I don't feel as bad asking for it because accidents do happen and I'm human mm -hmm. and being real about that just sets me up for better success. I think it's hard when you, are first starting out and you're seeing all these people on Instagram and you're like, man, my business is nowhere near as them. You know, I, I could so easily compare myself to a uh, night owl coffee cart. Corbin is killing the game. You know, he's got so many different coffee carts running at different venues and I could easily cycle into this thing of like, that's nowhere where I am, you know, and it's, it's so hard to be in that mentality. I don't want to be in a comparison mentality. Like he's got his thing and he's rocking it. I have my own thing and I'm going to continue doing that and see where it goes. So many great things that we've talked about in this whole conversation has kind of gone through some, you know, practical, you know, very business like stuff and some deep personal, uh, you know, life coaching moments. It's, <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Free therapy. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's what coffee does, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yeah, this has been really awesome, Sarah. And I, I guess my last question to you here as we wrap up is, you know, for those who are, you know, thinking about getting into starting a cart and doing things similar to you, whether that's at a farmer's market or just doing weddings and events, et cetera, um, what would you say is the number one thing that uh, they would, they should be prepared for that will give them resiliency or it'll help them develop resiliency and constants in the process? Oh man, I think the biggest thing is going to give yourself grace. You know, don't give pressure on yourself to start this within two weeks. There's no way that you can and be happy. Um, I think setting yourself up for success, it takes time, you know, and I think that we live in a world of instant gratification right now. And so it's, it's hard when things take sweat equity uh, but, um, and it can be very debilitating when you don't have a roadmap to follow. Um, but you know, if, if anyone ever wants to shoot me an email, I'm more than happy to help. Um, you know, I do offer coaching services where I take people from just thinking about doing their first coffee cart all the way into doing their first gig within 90 days. Um, but in terms of being prepared, I think you got to figure out where you want to be mentally and in your heart before you start this because if you just start and you have all these expectations you're going to disappoint yourself i think having a realistic expectation like a business plan is a great thing but life can just throw a lot of weird things at you you know and you got to be prepared that some things are going to take time and more money than you probably thought <laughs> <laughs> awesome that's great so, uh, thank you sarah so much uh, where can we go to learn more about your services, your cart, and all that fun stuff. Yeah, so you guys can follow. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Daybreak Coffee Cart. I also have a link tree in there, so if anyone is wanting to send me an information email on uh, coaching, you can go ahead and fill that out. I also have a website, just daybreakcoffeecart.com, and, uh, and my phone number's on there. Shoot me a text. Please be understanding that I have two kids, and I'll probably respond within four days, but I will respond. Wonderful. Again, great to have you on the show, Sarah. I appreciate all of the wisdom you shared today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was an absolute joy and pleasure.
Okay, everybody. Well, as you can tell, Sarah knows her stuff, and I hope that this conversation today shows you just how much goes into the process of doing a cart well, but that it's accessible. It's something that you can do, and it's something that is a great opportunity for you to serve your community. If you want this to be successful, you have to pay attention to the heart of the business in terms of both the operations and what you're offering people, not just with the menu, but with the service and the hospitality. Yeah, the heart be behind everything that you do. This is what creates not just a solid business on paper, but something that's electric and something that connects, something that is meaningful in the moment, especially in these moments where you find coffee carts like this in these highly meaningful moments like weddings and parties and celebrations. Uh, having your stuff together with business and with purpose is so, so important. And Sarah is just a great example of that. And I'm really happy that we got to talk to her today. So a big thank you to Sarah Naylor of Daybreak Coffee Carts. If you want more information, then just check them out over at daybreakcoffeecarts.com. And you should also follow them on Instagram, which is just at Daybreak Coffee Cart. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback from me about today's episode, feel free to email me chris at keys to the shop.com always love to hear your thoughts on these episodes and what keys to the shop is doing uh, you can feel free in those emails also to make suggestions about different topics or guests that you think would be uh, great on the show you know this show is meant to serve you as the coffee community global retail coffee professionals that you are and so uh, if you are uh, thinking about something and you wonder you know, what does Chris think about this? Or maybe this would be a good idea, uh, etc. I want this show to be evolving upward in its service to you. So communication with me is just a click away. Email chris at keys to the shop dot com. And, you know, we talked about the idea of putting together the great foundations of your business and a place where you can find a great deal of information that's accessible to you uh, in spades is Coffee Fest. Coffee Fest is more than a trade show. It's a center for resourcing and equipping you for successful coffee retail. And Coffee Fest as a trade show has been going on for 30 years. They accomplish this equipping with free and accessibly priced uh, lectures, trainings, workshops, panel discussions. Of course, as a trade show, you get to interact with vendors from an incredible range of products and services that will help you in your business. And then there's competitions like the Coffee Fest Latte Art World Championship Open or a Best Cold Brew. And then, of course, there's the community. There's you, there's me, there's everyone else there. We love coffee. Uh, we want to learn about it and we're in community so we get to make friends we get to enjoy coffee parties and fun stuff like that so it's obviously something that I think you would benefit from and your team would benefit from it use the code keys to get 50% off your registration for the upcoming shows in 2023 New York City Louisville Kentucky Anaheim California and Orlando Florida that is the fall show for 2023 so finally announced that and uh, it's going to be a great time. So uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all at these shows. Be sure to say hello. Go to coffeefest.com for all the information that you need about what Coffee Fest is doing, how to register. And again, I hope to see you there. Check them out at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show. Stay tuned for the Founder Friday this week. Coming up is Last Mile Cafe in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This brand new business, we talk all about how they started with popping up as a mobile operation. And now they're at their brick and mortar. And it's been, uh, by the time the episode airs, it will probably be 15 days that they've been open. So it's very fresh, very great perspective from a couple of very passionate people. And so you don't want to miss that. Have a great day, everybody. And happy holidays from me to you. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.